Coming up on Tech News Today, Twitter's music app will rock you out. China's invading Silicon Valley, and Bing is number one in malicious websites. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, April 12th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, or online store. Check out their new commerce solution so you can start selling stuff immediately. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT4. And by TechServe. TechServe assists U.S. businesses of all size with their technology needs, including Apple, Avid, Adobe, and HP solutions. Visit TechServe.com slash TNT and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zakhtar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show that keeps you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world. Put some in context for you, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feed. By the time you hear this news fuse, you may already have Twitter's new music app. Depending on which source familiar with the matter you believe, Twitter will launch its new music app today, Friday, or possibly sometime over the weekend at Coachella. But it is coming! Ryan Seacrest says so! Thursday, Twitter confirmed it acquired social music recommendation service We Are Hunted. The new Twitter music app will supposedly make recommendations based on your Twitter account and allow you to listen to clips from services like SoundCloud and iTunes. Mt. Gox may have been down from a DDoS, but venture capitalists are still hot for Bitcoin. TechCrunch reports several VCs have funded small exploratory rounds, ranging from a few hundred thousand dollars in seed money to a few million. But despite the uh, uh, the volality, the opinion seems to be that Bitcoin is worth pursuing. Were you or a loved one falsely accused that your iPod Touch or iPhone had water damage and refused warranted services from Apple? Then you may be entitled to a cash settlement. Wired says Apple's agreed to pay $53 million to settle a class action lawsuit for failing to honor warranties on the iPod Touch and iPhone. Apple had refused to repair devices if a white indicator in the device changed color, usually uh, denoting water damage, which isn't covered by Apple's warranty. However, the indicator maker 3M says humidity could have caused a false reading. T-Mobile USA started selling the iPhone 5 today for $99 as part of its new plans that don't require a contract and separate the cost of the phone from the cost of the service. In the UK, O2 announced O2 Refresh, which also separates service charges from monthly installments while you pay off the phone. Verizon just introduced a couple of new low-cost prepaid plans. For $35 per month, you can get 500 anytime minutes, unlimited text, and mobile web. But what does that mean, Verizon? Because the selection of phones are limited to non-smartphones like the LG Cosmos 2 and the ever-unknown Samsung Intensity 3. If you pay $50 per month, you can get unlimited talk in addition to unlimited text and data. This next story is for a very select few. Okay, so first, you've, you've got to be a, a Google service user. So use some kind of Google thing. And you have to plan to die. Uh, so if, you, if you're going to do those things, listen up. Google's introduced a new tool called the Inactive Account Manager, which will allow you to decide what happens to your account data if you do not access it for three months or more. The tool lets you pick trusted contacts who will gain access to your data after that set time period has passed. Google even lets you write a note to your trusted contacts so you can send an email from beyond the grave. Additionally, you can have all of your account data deleted after a set number of months. Think of your loved ones. Uh, Wired reported yesterday that China's top search firm Baidu has hired their first researcher at a new R&D office in Cupertino, California. The new office will be devoted to researching deep learning, an approach to computing that mimics the human brain. Baidu also signed a partnership with Intel for research related to mobile apps. Intel will provide hardware to developers to test and port software to the Baidu and Intel platforms. The Panasonic ZT60 will be the final plasma TV from Panasonic. CNET reports Kiyoshi Okamoto, vice president of Panasonic Display, confirmed that Panasonic's future R&D efforts will be channeled to OLED technology instead through a partnership with Sony. 
Everyone's waiting for the cost of solid state storage to dip down below magnetic spinning disks, and IBM says it's finally there, at least in the server room, sort of. Uh, Big Blue made the case Thursday that when you take into account power, cooling, floor space, and software costs, flash drives are now the cheaper way. Coincidentally, IBM also announced a new family of all flash storage arrays. Uh, they had on hand Sprint, Kroger Grocery Stores, and Thomson Reuters, all backing up IBM, saying that they have implemented these arrays and saw big improvements in access speeds, latency, and database performance. According to AV Test, an independent testing lab, Bing delivers approximately five times as many malware-infested website results compared to Google. AV Test looked at over 40 million websites. Out of 10 million results, Google returned 272 malicious res results. For Bing, 1,285 results out of 10 million were infected. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, a blog, a portfolio, or now an online store. If you haven't heard, Squarespace has introduced a new commerce solution that allows you to instantly create a store and start selling products. Squarespace Commerce provides a powerful and flexible e-commerce solution integrated to work with every one of those award-winning Squarespace template designs, allowing sales for both physical and digital goods. So, you can sell ebooks and real books. You can sell music CDs or MP3s. Fast merchant account setup so you can accept payments right away by credit or debit card. Single interface for order management, tracking orders, providing customer email updates, printing shipping labels, and adding coupons. Squarespace Commerce is included with a business plan subscription, which starts at $24 a month when you sign up for a year or $30 for the monthly plan. And don't forget, you still get the best mobile experience. Squarespace automatically redesigns your website so it looks great on the i they don't say that i just made that up they on the on the phone on the tablet all it always looks good that's the point so when somebody looks at your website it looks like it was designed for that particular screen plus you get that exceptionally well designed squarespace award winning template you get 24/7 customer support reliability hosting domains design development the whole schlub meal for a free trial, go to squarespace.com, sign up for a free account. You don't have to give them a credit card number to sign up for the free account. Just do it. It's easy. You can do it right now while I'm talking. Try it out. Start building a website. If you decide to purchase it, use offer code TNT4 and get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, including monthly and annual plans. And don't forget about free domain registrations for annual plan customer subscriptions. That's squarespace.com. Use the offer code TNT4, everything you need to create an exceptional website. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now, uh, f fresh from surgery, Mr. Darren Kitchen. Uh, dude, thanks for uh, for joining us. I appreciate the dedication, I really do. Yeah, absolutely, and if anybody is looking for a gallbladder, I've got a slightly used one on eBay right now. <laughs> Check it out, you can get a real hacker gallbladder hacked this week. For Pre-hacked. <laughs> HAK5.org, of course, the, is the Hack5 website that Darren hails from. And let's start by talking about this Twitter app that Ryan Seacrest just can't get enough of. Yeah, so I keep refreshing Twitter because it could go live at any moment, really. Um, All Things D uh, first reported Twitter's got a new music app. It's going to launch today, which is Friday. Then updated the post to say, well, it might be over the weekend because Coachella, the music festival down in Southern California, starts this weekend and runs through the next couple of weeks. So maybe that would be a really, really good tie-in because it's a huge music festival and it draws a lot of people and it's going to get a lot of attention. But the idea is, okay, well, whether it's today or this weekend, most uh, everyone's in agreement that this is actually coming. So what's it going to do? The idea is that uh, the music app will be a standalone app for iOS, at least at the beginning, uh, and will suggest artists and tracks to you or me based on who we're following, who our friends are following, trending stuff, that kind of thing. So you could listen to clips of music from inside the app. Clips would come from iTunes, SoundCloud, that kind of thing. You could watch music videos provided by Vivo, uh, which is, of course, is the probably the number one place that anybody's watching music videos these days. And there's a placeholder at music.twitter.com. Um, last I checked right before the show, it's live. But when you sign up or when you try to sign up, it doesn't actually go anywhere. It, it, it authenticates you through Twitter, and then it kind of redirects back to that, that first page. But as you mentioned, Tom, in the news views, uh, Twitter bought We Are Hunted last year, but nobody from either company had actually confirmed it until today. Um, 
the We Are Hunted team is joining Twitter. The service is shuttering. Uh, they say if uh, you want to get your data from your account, your account's going to be shut down, but you can submit your email address or usernames to download favorites. The service has been around since 2007, so if you were a loyal, enthusiastic user, you might have a lot of data in there. And as you mentioned yesterday, uh, and I'm sure this is because he has a huge following on Twitter, Ryan Seacrest tweeted that the service is great, that it is real, that everyone at American Idol is having so much fun with it. So, um, you know, it w wasn't like a post that got taken down. In fact, Twitter, uh, one of the Twitter, official Twitter accounts retweeted him. So this is all kind of a big promotional thing. I as what do you think? Uh, Twitter uh, is definitely into the verticals these days. Is music the next frontier? Yeah, I, I was actually looking for some new music to listen to and actually went to Twitter to find out a bunch of things from the people that are following me or just reading up on, on whoever's on, on my list or whatever. And I got a huge amount of, of suggestions, but then I had to go into Spotify or go into Pandora or go into this other thing. And the thing about Twitter that's so great is you can get all kinds of suggestions from people that you don't even know versus going to something like Google where you have these circles. You might not see the everything. You have this this stream that you, you lose a lot of the data on Facebook's okay. You got that thing with Spotify on the right rail, and who knows what's going on in there. Every single thing is about somebody's cat, or it's about Spotify, or it's about whatever frictionless sharing device is in there. So Twitter, I think, because you can control some of it, could be kind of interesting for music because I could see using this as a music discovery tool in the long run. Darren, I know the uh, there's there's lots of lots of music news these days. The Verge is actually reporting that Apple is expected to sign. Uh, a deal with uh, Universal as soon as next week. Warner Music may be right behind. Mm -hmm. That's sort of this whole Pandora killer rumor that has been floating around for a while. Do you think Twitter might be pushing out its music service uh, just so they aren't the last ones to the table? Well, it seems like everybody has to meet to a music service, but um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I, it'd be interesting to see how Twitter responds to you know other music services that have already had success in uh, you know, social music, uh, things like Pandora, where, you know, I like a track and then I share it on Twitter. And we've seen how Twitter has done an about face on their third party app developers. I wonder how uh, with them going into music, how that will change, say, the way that they react to the integration of Twitter into other music apps. Tom, I know uh, we've had some, we've talked about Vine a bit. Um, I'm, I'm sort of bearish on the whole idea, but I mean, I think Vine is a standalone app that Twitter also controls, works really well, but then when you start pushing it into main Twitter feeds, that's when I think, for me, it gets kind of noisy. Do you think that music is going to fare better? Well, okay, it, 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 I totally see that. I could totally see that becoming an annoying thing if, if it caught on, and, but Vine hasn't really caught on enough to annoy me yet, uh, at least after the first couple of days, it calmed right down. On the other hand, what Twitter does well is it says, we are good at this part, this messaging part, so we're just going to do that. We're not going to try to compete with Facebook. We're not going to be an app platform. We're not going to be your contact list, all of this stuff. So it may be smart for them to say, we're not actually going to be a music service. We're not going to sell you the music. We're just going to be a recommendation engine because that seems like a natural outgrowth of what we've got going on there. And if that's the case, and it's not a bunch of new posts, but it's a thing that I can look at and say like, oh, this is what my friends are already posting and listening to, because that happens already, that, that might be actually a really good way to go about this. Actually, this would also be in line with that whole Twitter refresh on their cards, where they had all these developers, the, this press conference for developers or a conference for developers, mm -hmm. showing off all new styles of cards. One of them, I think, was called a player. I don't know if it was a video player and or an audio player. That would make a lot of sense that you could just click, expand the card, and play right in there. It would also line up perfectly with the service. Yeah. I I say the one thing that I, that I really dislike about music apps, and I try them all because I like music so much, is, you know, like the 30-second... Uh, let's see what the song sounds like, an excerpt from iTunes, really doesn't cut it. In fact, I've kind of stopped using certain apps where if I have shares a song, you know, Path or maybe mm -hmm. Soundtracking or something, I already know I'm not about to hear the whole song, and most of the time I'm not clicking through. So it'll be interesting to see if Twitter can put some sort of a fresh spin on that. So this, this all ends up being something that uh, translates into people buying music and everybody being happy. Let's talk a little bit about the Chinese invasion of Silicon Valley. Uh, Baidu hiring their first researcher. The office in Cupertino, California, has actually been open for about a year. They've had some other people working there. But this is the first of their research and development effort. It's called the Institute of Deep Learning. Uh, and it joins lots of folks out there who are trying to figure out this 
neural network, artificial intelligence way of doing computing, something that mimics the way the human brain works. Google, for instance, recently hired Jeffrey Hinton, who's one of the pioneers in deep learning research. Uh, if you use Google's voice recognition or if you use Siri, you're using an example of deep learning in action. And Kai Yu, who leads Baidu's speech and image recognition search team, made this first hire. So it seems like that's the area that they're going to focus to begin with. They are doing this effort in the U.S., hoping to attract some of the talent that's down there, some of those engineers, uh, and maybe see some side benefits. They already are doing Baidu I, which is their project glass competitor. We've talked about that previously. Darren, what do you think uh, of Baidu setting up shop in Silicon Valley? Hey, why not? I mean, if this is where the talent is, um, you know, don't restrict yourself to some, you know, place globally. If you're an internet company, the internet is all over and you should be all over. So uh, I, I don't have any qualms with that. I think it's great. And, and any, any innovation in this space is going to be good. Uh, I, I will note that as a privacy advocate, I think all of this stuff is really great, but I get a little bit concerned sometimes where you look at the models and you're like, well, the only way all of these models get really good is the more they learn about you. And I just hope that um, that Baidu it can be a good shepherd to this sort of technology in the terms of privacy. For example, with uh, Swipe or Swift Key on Android, the keyboard, for example, they get better and better with machine learning with this kind of artificial intelligence if you let it read your email and your tweets and things of that nature. So, yeah, but I don't think that uh, that Baidu is uh, moving to this, to bringing, uh, you know, coming to Silicon Valley is uh, is negative at all. I think this is only good. I think it does show that Silicon Valley is still considered the place you need to go for research. Uh, that's where the that's where the talent is. If if even Baidu has to uh, set up shop there, Ayaz, what do you what do you make of this uh, this movement? And Baidu is certainly not the first. They're sort of jumping in on on what is a is becoming a bigger and bigger bandwagon for this sort of artificial intelligence research. I think for the most part, I agree with Darren. If the talent is here, this is where, where this company has to go. Uh, I was just thinking about that whole anti poaching agreement that was going on between. Lucasfilm, Apple, and a bunch of other tech companies. And to have more companies in the area that actually have backing in the nuts and startup, it's a company that's going to be around for a long time. It's going to attract some of the people that were working at Google. They don't have to move you know, across the world to get a job. They're probably going to be uh, wooed over. Say, hey, let's, let, you know, we want to do some of these things. Google's great and everything. You get free lunch, but you could start here and we could do some great things. Yeah, I mean, when you look at it, you see that uh, there's some a lot of universities uh, are, are, are doing deep learning research groups. Then you have places that you might expect like Google, Microsoft Research, uh, the uh, IBM Research Lab ha has an arm doing this. There's something called the Gatsby Unit at the University College London. Uh, great name. Mo most of these are institutions. But joining Google, Microsoft, and IBM is Baidu. I think that's really interesting to, to look at Baidu as now not just not just the Google of China, uh, but sort of the, an, another Google competitor in the world doing these sorts of advanced research projects that don't bear immediate fruit for the main business. How would that change, um, if, if at all, uh, like visas? Uh, you know, if you're a student who's, who's, who's top of your class and maybe you're, I don't know, a Chinese student who's going to Stanford, right? And you graduate and work visas can be really complicated. You hear this from large companies all the time that the system is broken. It's hard to retain wonderful talent from, from, from all over the world. If you're a Chinese company that's operating in, in California, you know, I wonder if that makes it that much easier to kind of just set up shop rather than being forced to go through a lot of uh, hoops to, to stay here. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that might bear on the decision to say, look, if I, set, if I set up an office in Silicon Valley, I don't have to deal with visas on any side. I just, I just hire the locals. Uh, I'll get some Americans working for me and I don't have to worry about it. Uh, I would think they, I, you know, that's a really good question. Would they want to hire Chinese students out of Stanford and, and Berkeley? Uh, or, or would they want them to come back to Baidu and, and work at, at, in China anyway, uh, rather than, than have them stay in the United States? Intriguing question. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, Verizon and uh, their answer. We heard about T-Mobile. We heard about O2. Uh, what's this $35 prepaid plan? Does it compare to T-Mobile? Uh, sort of, I guess, if you're looking at the numbers. but So Verizon's got this new pre prepaid plan, like Sarah mentioned. 35 bucks gets you 500 anytime minutes, unlimited text, picture messaging, unlimited mobile web. If you go over that 500-minute allotment, you're going to pay $0.25 cents per minute. 
Mobile to mobile calling is not included in this plan, and it's got this very limited selection of phones. You, you've got four phones you can choose from: LG Cosmos 2, the Samsung Gusto 2, the Samsung Intensity 3, and the LG Extrovert. Three of these things are messaging phones, and one of them is a flip phone that looks like it's from I don't know 1998. Uh, Darren, you were on the phone with Verizon trying to figure out some of these plans. What, what did you find out? I found out that I'm not the target market. I found out that you can't bring any other smartphone to this plan. It's only those four feature phones. None of them run Android. Um, none of them allow you to do tethering. Uh, the, the only thing that really enticed me is the idea of $35 a month prepaid for unlimited web. That's air quotes there for the audio listeners. Uh, that was explained to me that... Um, that the web plan is only for mobile web access and does not, quote, include full web browsing. That was explained to me as you can get to, like, Facebook, but not necessarily all of the other sites on the Internet uh, where they may not display properly on that device. And uh, of those, I looked into which ones are hackable to add tethering, and it looks like the Samsung Intensity 3 might be your best bet, but uh, I was not able to get any information as to how many megabytes are included in that unlimited web. Uh, basically, the, the representative told me, look, these phones are targeted towards people who text and don't talk and don't use the web. And so I'm just wondering, $35 just for unlimited texting? Who is that for? Teenagers. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like how everybody got the hand-me-downs of the parents' cars, right? That's what College we did in students. my day. I mean, yeah. They were junky, and we were just, like, happy to be able to go from point A to point B. I, as you're giving me, like, the weirdest look right now, but that's totally what's going on here. I, well, I could see what you're saying. Parents go, you text all day long. You look up everything you want, but you're not going to get a shiny new fancy phone. You're going to get one of these. Haven't we seen enough reports saying that a bunch of teenagers in the U.S. have, like, Apple iPhones or sure, Android phones? Sure, but not and, everybody's got that kind of money. But the thing is, when I, when I was looking at these plans, the only thing that looks similar to T-Mobile or uh, a bunch of the other pre paid ones like Virgin is that that price is $35. But on the other carriers, you can get much better phones. You can get smartphones. You can do tethering. There's all kinds of things you can do on another carrier. What I'm curious about, based on this price, does this just seem like Verizon is saying, hey, look, we have this number here, 35 bucks. You're going to have a really cruddy selection of phones, but we don't have to even worry about that because we've got the biggest network. Yeah, yeah it was, it's the, the Verizon of, of the early part of the, the 2000s, right? Best network cruddy phones. They're like, oh, we actually have good smartphones now, so we need to have a cruddy phone plan still for heritage. <laughs> you think this is just consistency? I think there's more to it than that. Well, that's, I, mean, I think there is, I just, too. It just drives me crazy uh, to see this I think it is teenagers. I think, it's, uh, I think it's people on a serious budget. Uh, I, it could be college students as well who are, you know, like, I, I need something to keep in touch with friends, but I can't spend a lot of money on a phone. Uh, but you're right. I, as if you shop around, it, it's the only thing that you can, you're can you getting here is the network. Yeah, in fact, I'm actually looking at a $37 LG Optimus S used on Ting. Yeah. So it's like, come on. Not even close. All right, let's take a, a quick break and welcome another new sponsor to the network. Uh, happy to have TechServe, T-E-K-S-E-R-V-E. -E. It's New York's premier authorized Apple reseller and technology provider serving creative professionals at all levels from individual customers on up to Fortune 100 companies. So if you work at a big company, this is great. But if you're an individual, pay attention. This might be good for you too. TechServe carries a full range of Apple products, iPhones, iPads, iMacs, MacBooks, iPods, all the things you'd expect. Uh, but they also have a range of partnerships with top vendors to facilitate flexible, efficient, and creative solutions for your business needs if you need to deploy a lot of stuff at once. Uh, tech services, businesses of all size to deploy Apple, Avid, and Adobe solutions throughout the United States. They've done some amazing things. One of the things we were talking about right before the show, if you've been to the Delta terminals in LaGuardia Airport in New York, or maybe up at YYZ in Toronto or Minneapolis, you may have noticed nearly every seat in the terminal has an iPad. Travelers can now sit anywhere in the terminal, receive real-time flight updates on the iPad, use the iPad to order food, play some games, browse the net, check some email, They've got 100, they got 1.5 million, 100, forget that, 1.5 million visitors using these iPads. And OTG Management, that's the hospitality company behind the terminals, had TechServe provide the iPads, configure them, install them, and deploy them. Uh, and they keep adding more terminals. So th these guys know how to do big deployments. TechServe is a natural place to turn if you want support 
personalization, configuration. You need to manage a massive iPad project. TechServe is able to do full lifecycle management for all your technology needs by providing the devices that you need, getting them up and running, and then teaching you and your staff how to effectively use them and maintain them so they keep working efficiently. TechServe also provides ongoing support so that if your enterprise has a problem, you just call them up, they'll help you out. If you're considering adding iPads to your business, and I know we see a lot of stories about this, why not ensure the project's success with the world's most experienced partner? If your business is considering integrating iOS technology at your workplace, do this. Contact TechServe today and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. That's techserve.com, T-E-K-S-E-R-V-E.com slash T-N-T. And TechServe will help you assess your current or future iPad needs and give you the advice to make it a success. If you're like, wait a minute, what was that again? T-E-K-S-E-R-V-E, techserve.com slash T-N-T. And we thank TechServe for their support of Tech News Today. All right. As if we didn't have enough fun with Facebook, now you can, you can do steganography. You can encode hidden messages in your Facebook pictures. That's right. At least if you want to use Chrome. A Chrome extension, uh, which was made by an Oxford University computer science student um, who also used to intern at Google. His name is Owen Campbell Moore. Uh, created this uh, method of sharing messages hidden in JPEG images that are uploaded to Facebook. Now, once uploaded, the only way to unlock them is through a password that is created by the uploader. And the messages are restricted to 140 characters. Not sure if that's a nod to Twitter or not. But here's what's kind of interesting is Facebook automatically sort of garbles these messages through recompression, which happens anytime anybody loads anything up to Facebook. So Campbell Moore said, all right, well, what do I have to do? I have to replicate Facebook's recompression algorithm as closely as possible. Then when encoding a message, uh, the extension auto compresses the image, kind of like the way that Facebook would. Then it makes little changes to add some redundancy. And he says this minimizes the amount of change it'll undergo when Facebook does recompress it, keeping the damage to the secret message sort of little to none. And since the extension runs through a web browser without a server connection, users can't be detected by network analysis. Pretty hard for Facebook to block permissions because the extension isn't uh, relying on a Facebook API of any kind. And he says, yeah, sure, a researcher could probably build a system for detecting which images have secret messages in them. But that would be, that would mean that they were accessing, what, over 300 million photos that are being uploaded to Facebook every day. The NSA probably doesn't even have that kind of access. And performing mm -hmm. detection on that scale would be very difficult. So, Darren, I'll start with you. Is this... Is, does this seem like something that would be a viable communication tool, you know, for for for, for pirates or, or or terrorists or people just wanting to communicate with each other and feel like they are really, really private? Um, so the idea of steganography is hiding something in plain sight. Uh, and yes, the way that I feel is encrypt all the things, whether it is cat photos or your tax returns or whatever it may be. Um, so if this gets more people using that kind of encryption or even just thinking about the concept of hiding stuff in plain sight uh, and, and, and using encryption with services like this, I, I, ask, I, I totally strongly get behind that. I hope that uh, Facebook doesn't do anything to tweak their algorithm to remove this kind of stuff in fear that, oh, no, the terrorists will use encryption. It's like, come on, please. Um, so, yes, more encryption. Bring it on. Tom, do you worry that, you know, if people who are worried about Facebook privacy in general get wind of this, we have to worry about more and more people combing through our pictures, wondering if we're encrypting secret messages? Well, that's the thing, right? If you, if you need to comb through all 300 million just to detect that there is a secret message hidden in there, you still have to decode it. It doesn't mean you're going to immediately be able to decode it. So this is a, this is a pretty robust way of protecting your privacy, Maybe mm -hmm. maybe maybe this is the best way to share things on Facebook. Frankly, Tom, uh, actually, is, actually, one of one of my friends, what he does is uh, he use, he set up a program that basically fills his entire hard drive with thousands of small encrypted volumes. Now, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of them are red herrings. See where I'm going with this? Yeah, Except yeah, exactly. Well, Facebook is kind of a natural thing for that. Uh, can it be, I mean, when you get down to like, oh, can it be used for, for, for bad things? Sure. I mean, 
anything that protects your privacy also protects the privacy of people who aren't as nice and good as you. Uh, and that, that's always an issue. So that, that's an entirely different argument. But I'm just impressed with his ability to enfold this into that Facebook compression. Uh, and it would be very easy, I think, though, for Facebook to just change their compression and mess with this if they wanted to. I don't know why they'd want to. Well, so that... They're Somebody besides a, face, yeah, exactly. They're not seeing it. Some like they're, they're helping the stuff go along. But I, I, Facebook, for the most part, is banned in lots of different countries where you could do the secret communication through this means. If you want to use Facebook and you're trying to like incite a revolution, usually Facebook's banned in that country in the first place. So I don't know if this is going to be very useful for those kinds of use for like dissidents and things. But, but this, this, but it's not just Facebook. The thing is, steganography mm -hmm. and the idea of hiding a, a, a message in an image. Uh, can be applied to uh, not just images, audio files, basically anything. And so it's completely agnostic to Twitter. So if Twitter is blocked in your country because, oh, no, you're going to use it to actually have private communications, well, then paste bin, then anything else, then just tweeting, you know, AES encrypted stuff. You can do that right now. You can find a JavaScript AES encryptor and then put in, I, I, you can't fit 140 characters because of the overhead. But, yeah, you could, you could totally do that. Or maybe maybe you're not trying to start a revolution. Maybe you're having a perfectly legitimate but uh, private conversation, and you're like, you know what? I know we can both use Facebook uh, to to send these these messages and keep them secret. And, yeah. and there's I mean, nothing it, nefarious going on. In it's the perfect social conference. network, the carrier or the 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 provider, the ISP, Facebook or whatever, doesn't even know what you're sharing with your friends. That in in a perfect social network. Right. Meanwhile, Bing is delivering you some malicious websites. It's almost the opposite of this previous story. What's, what's going on with this IS? <laughs> like I mentioned before, the, uh, the German independent testing lab, AB Test, uh, they checked out a bunch of websites, 40 million websites, and they, they checked out seven different search engines. They looked at 10 million, 10 million results from Google, 10 million from Bing, and of the 40 million sites, AB Test found 5,000 pieces of malware. Now, Google was one of the safest by returning only 272 malicious results in 10 million, Bing returned 1,285 out of 10, 10 million. So people are screaming, that's five times more. It's, it's about 4.7. But that's a lot more than Google. And I'm looking at this story. I'm thinking, hey, I actually started thinking about Yahoo. Since Yahoo is powered by Bing, Sarah, do you think Yahoo could just use this as a way to get the heck away from Microsoft when it comes to the way Bing powers its search? You're saying, like, you're all about malicious stuff. Well... Yes, I suppose that could be a bargaining tactic, right? I mean, if Yahoo really doesn't want to be associated with... I guess the, the thing about this is I look at these numbers and I go, wow, that's surprising, almost five times the amount. And I'm not using Bing at all as often as I am using Google. But, I mean, are you, do you feel like in, in your Bing experience, you, you're, you know, there's malicious websites all over the place, whereas with Google there isn't? In my Bing it's experience, really depends on what you're looking for. It's a limited Bing experience. Yeah. I, in, in my usage, I usually use it for uh, video searches and things. I haven't found that to be the case. Although this is a really small percentage, you know, 1285 out of 10 million is a tiny, tiny percentage. Tom, you tried out Bing for a whole month. What, what, what's your uh, your anecdotal experience? Well, granted, that was a couple of years ago now, so I, I don't think those results are, are relevant anymore. Uh, but what I've heard. Uh, and, and the few times I've used Bing, it's very good at returning results. I think this kind of stuff is a little bit overblown. Of course, Google's going to be better at, at stomping malicious sites because there's so many malicious sites. And Google has been building up defenses against this for a lot longer than Bing. And frankly, the, the amount of malware that's shown here doesn't seem to be a great percentage of it. So it's bragging rights for Google and, and good for them. But I don't think this is damning news for Bing. And, I, and, I, and to answer your question about Yahoo, I'm not sure Yahoo wants to separate uh, from Bing. And I don't think this would get them out of their contractual agreement, e even if they did. Darren, what do you think about this? Can Microsoft stand proud to say, hey, look, we're not copying Google's results at all? <laughs> You're right. They absolutely can. You know what they can say, though? They can say both us and Google are 100 percent susceptible to zero day attacks that aren't known. And at, at which point you just look at this study and you're like, meh, I don't think it's going to change anybody's usage habits. Oh, yeah. I, I, Tom Z in the chat room claims Bing gives better adult content results, which uh, because there's more malware in adult content sites, maybe that's why they this, they had this problem. I don't know if A-B tests went into that level of, yeah. uh, of, of detail in their study. At least I'm, I haven't read the full one. They did look at 18 months worth of data. So it's it was over a large number of time. And like everyone's saying, I don't think this is going to make a huge 
a dent in anything for, for, for Google. They're not going to say, oh, look, we're five times safer than the other guys. They don't need to do that. They've got their own issues to deal with with the EU and other antitrust issues going on. And Microsoft's just struggling anyway. They don't need this kind of news. They don't need to find out that their service is not as good as Google when it comes to malware. But yeah, it's bad PR. Think, well, the other thing is with, uh, what is it, competition and marketing and PR and whatnot. So, like, oh, our stuff is more secure. It, it never comes into play because people don't care about that, unfortunately. They care about features and how it makes my life more convenient, not necessarily how it saves me some, from some potential threat. All right, let's finish off with a new way of finding yourself. Uh, this was announced actually Wednesday. Uh, University of Michigan had a win on Wednesday. Let's give them that. Uh, by DARPA researchers, part of the Micro PNT project. It's a new TIMU, uh, Timing and Inertial Measurement Unit, that is as thin as a couple of human hairs, a mere... 10 cubic millimeters and everyone made a big deal about the fact that it can fit inside the depiction of the lincoln memorial that's on the back of the u.s penny so it's really damn small is what that means uh it's made of silicon dioxide contains a six axis imu that's three gyroscopes and three accelerometers along with a master clock which gives you the three things you need to navigate orientation acceleration and time and it's an inertial system. So the idea is if GPS gets jammed or if GPS is failing or you're in a tunnel and you can't access the GPS satellites, you can use this as a supplemental way to find your way from point A to point B. It's an inertial system. Those predate GPS, but back before GPS, inertial systems were the size of a refrigerator. So this is kind of amazing. Uh, it can be used for personnel tracking, handheld navigation, small diameter munitions, even small airborne platforms. Uh, Darren... Pretty pretty amazing stuff here. Mostly going to be used for ill or good, hard to say. But but could this eventually? They're saying right now, well, this isn't going to replace GPS. It's just supplemental. But could it someday? Do you think? I think that it's one of those things that you just need to, especially if it's a small and a, a potentially inexpensive, just build it into everything anyway. For the day when GPS, uh, for one reason or another, is retired. And we're all so reliant on these uh, devices. And as long as you know where you are, you can know where you're going. Otherwise, we could all just learn how to use a sextant, which could be fun, too. <laughs> Sextants are, aren't good in the dark, though. They're really not. But why, why are you traveling during the day? The zombies are going to get you during the day. Everyone knows that. Exactly. Uh, I has this, uh, this impress you at all? Uh, yeah, a bit. When, when you lose that GPS signal and you have that moment of terror, as in you have no idea what's going to happen in the next three minutes when you're trying to figure out, was I supposed to make a turn? If this can calculate the data between GPS signal loss, that would be fantastic. The size of this made me very interested. I'm just kind of curious if this is going to w work its way into the, all of these smartwatches. We keep hearing about one day they're going to show up. If you have a GPS on your wrist, that's small. Oh, yeah. I know they do exist already as these little uh, the PNDs, the personal navigation devices. But they're pretty bulky. They look like the old. They look like my watch, actually. So they're. Uh, I think this could allow for really smart technologies that are wearable that al actually help you know where you're going. How about not only wearable, but maybe just under the skin? Pretty thin. Chip your cat. Couple Ooh, human I like hairs. It. I like actually, yeah, it. You could really chip your pets <clears throat> much better. Chip yourself. I want to be able yeah. to hack chip any, my I know chip I have, everything. Have chip, me. chip all the things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. After you've encrypted them, let's move on to the random ones. I was so excited today when I looked at the Daily Telegraph and it said an Iranian scientist has claimed to have invented a time machine. Finally! I got a little disappointed. Which direction when I found is it going? Out. Yeah, it, it's not a time machine. It, it actually just allows you to see five to eight years into the future and predict details. But, but that's still pretty cool. And then the Iranian government came out later this morning and said, this has not been registered. The guy's a quack. Well, what? Wah, wah. Did he, was he just, what did he say was going to happen eight years from now? You just well, hopefully get it right? Well, he would have, yeah, right? He <laughs> should have been able to predict that they were going to make this announcement and head it off. So. That's not how time machines work at all. This is not a time machine. Maybe this we is someone saying, saying like I'm psychic. Telescope. A time telescope? Maybe. Yeah. If you can see into the future, yeah, so I guess it's a, it's a mechanized psychic. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's a crystal ball. I thought this much. already existed on Main Street in Disneyland, and her name was Esmeralda. 
You put a quarter in and she gives you a little card and it tells you your Prior future. Prior art! <laughs> I don't think there's any patent case in this, assuming he actually has this down. Oh, if Iran has a time machine, like they're going to tell any of us about it. So maybe this is all just a little bit of a, no, 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 this guy's a quack. He doesn't know what's going on. All right, let's Smoke figure out how to get it. How do we use this? Now, I, I love this quote from Iran's Deputy Minister of Science, Research, and Technology, Mohammad Mekdinejad Nouri, uh, said, Making scientific claims is free for all, but registration of these claims as inventions should undergo certain legal stages based on scientific proofs and evidence. Such a claim has not been registered in Iran's State Organization for Registration for Strategic Inventions in relation to the time machine. So, so all he has to do to register it is tell us what's going to happen in five to eight years, and in five to eight years we can verify whether it was true or not. Exactly. In fact, I could predict that the Earth will keep spinning and new phones will come out. Whoa. Whoa. Dude. Blew my mind. Patent that. Uh, you know who else can tell the future? Patent that. Sarah. Well, it's true. In fact, today I can also use my little crystal ball to look into the past. On this day in 1961, you know what happened? Yuri Gagarin became the first human to go into space. That's right. Yuri's night. Way. Now let's look into the future again. Uh, let's look to Sunday. Sunday the 14th, Star to... Wars, the Old Republic expansion, Rise of the Hut Cartel is launching. <sighs> and then on Monday the 15th of April, D Dive into Mobile Conference starts, runs through Tuesday the 16th in New York City. New York City. Oh my gosh. She knows she the know? future. Let's well, see what's incoming. Amarino. Incoming message. <laughs> We got a message from Brian from Minnesota. He goes, thanks for the show. I generally enjoy the balanced talk. However, all of you were pretty dismissive of Bitcoin's use to buy actual things with, starting only at the physical goods section of the Bitcoin wiki, which is section 7 of 11 and skips the majority of business listings. There are hundreds of businesses taking Bitcoins covering everything from video games to political do donations or charity work to dentistry. That doesn't count the thousands of people who use Bitcoin for person-to-person -person transactions or the many businesses who accept Bitcoin, Bitcoin but haven't bothered to get listed on the wiki. I, too, have been working with Bitcoin since February 2011, since hearing it described on Security Now, and have bought everything from coffee to jewelry for my wife using Bitcoin as a currency. I've owned a total of over 300 coins and have actually used them instead of speculated with them, a point of pride for me because if it wasn't for people using their coins they would actually have no value. Now, I admire Brian's enthusiasm here, but I feel like this is a little bit of the, is the glass mostly empty or is the glass have a little bit of water in it uh, <laughs> or, or bourbon or whatever you want to be in it? Because Ooh, hundreds of businesses, well, more than none, uh, compared to the number of businesses in existence is still small. And I think that's, that's the only point we're making is like there aren't a lot of options when you walk out your door uh, to go spend Bitcoin, and even when you surf around on the web. But point taken from Brian that there are probably more places where you can spend Bitcoin than you might have thought. And we'll include this uh, link in our in our show notes because I, I didn't realize there are uh, a bunch of clothing places, like yeah, the shoe web shop. Jonathan wrote in as well, said, hey, TNT people, I recently started using the Key Ring app to manage all of my loyalty cards for various retailers, and I love it. So what if Foursquare were to acquire them or integrate the same sort of feature into their app? Check in on your loyalty card. Barcode is right there, maybe with other offers as it stands now. Key Ring already does this to a degree, but I could see Foursquare benefiting from it more as I'd always be sure to pop it open for the loyalty barcode. Yeah, I think that's actually probably a next logical step for a company like Foursquare that's going to put a lot more effort into partnerships uh, with businesses who pay Foursquare a little bit of money in order to to, to serve up uh, discounts for people like us. That makes perfect sense. I mean, if, they, if Foursquare could could either, gosh, I don't know, what would they do? Would they integrate with something like Passcode or Google Wallet more efficiently or would they build their own? I think partnership. I think partnership with Foursquare is the way to go. And and this idea of your loyalty card. Lots of people use that all the time in the supermarket. These kinds of things. You're trying to do that. If it's just a, if you're now trying to look at your Foursquare app to do that, you'll see more deals and a lot more businesses want to use it. Anything that replaces the need to carry around a ton of stupid cards. A loyalty and sign card up for, for a yeah. free sandwich. I'm all for. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Make it that virtual. is it uh, for our show today. Darren Kitchen. Thank you for for persisting uh, with us today. Absolutely. I hope you feel better quick, man. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I want to remind everybody that Hack Across America kicks off May 1st and that it's all about you guys and uh, coming out to, to, to be with the community. So if you haven't already signed up, go ahead. Uh, even if you just want to attend a meetup, just so I can get an idea of where there's uh, lots of interest, uh, hackacrossamerica.com is where you can find out all the details of that trip. Check it out, hackacrossamerica.com. You can also go to our subreddit. If you uh, have a, an article that you'd like us to consider for inclusion in the show, go to technewstoday.reddit.com, submit that article, and then allow the audience to vote on it. Uh, vote it up, vote it down. You can vote on things too. Technewstoday.reddit.com helps us pick the show every day. Also, if there was a part of the show at some point during the week that you thought that was one of the best moments of Tech News Today all year, I would like to make sure that Jason includes that in the best of show at the end of the year. Go to twit.tv slash best of. Let us know about it. In fact, that works for any show on Twit. Do it now. Twit.tv slash best of. Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT anytime, day or night. You can email us TNT at twit.tv or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back Monday with Father Robert Balisser from Twiet as our guest. See you then. Yeah.